Dissect, analyze, examine, study, scrutinize, and extract an essence of reality from a fog of illusion and confusion. You can find me on Studio B every Thursday at 1700 hours Pacific Time. That's 8 p.m. Eastern. No topic taboo, no subject too strange. I strive to take a neutral standpoint during the dissection of the topic at hand. That's Reality Extraction with Mr. Rowe on Revolution Radio. This is your host, Barbara Jean Lindsay, and you're listening to the Cosmic Oracle Show. It's Tuesday, February 21st, and we have a a wonderful guest that I'm really excited to uh, introduce you to. I've just met him um, briefly the last couple of weeks, so he's a a new friend, and I think you'll find him interesting and uh, stimulating and full of wisdom uh, for all of our listeners today. And thank you for, and his name is Michael Lee Hill. That might be good if I give you a name, Michael. (laughs) Well, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) And so welcome to the show today, Michael. And um, uh, we want to thank everyone for uh, listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We are the largest internet radio station in the world. And we have 100% listener supported radio station and we're here thanks to your generous support so you're the ones that help keep us on the air so please click that donate button and give whatever you can afford all you have to do is go to freedomslips.com push that button no amount is too small and we really appreciate your continued support and we have as our producer the one and only patrick english how you doing patrick oh fine thank you honey how are you Good, good. It's still raining here in California, but we're still here. Oh, how's that dam doing? Well, my family's there, and they're they're still there. They haven't evacuated, so it comes and goes. So, um, so far, they're all packed and ready to go at the last minute if they need be, but they're a little bit stubborn, too, and so they decided to stay, and they're not quite at, they're about 40 minutes from the dam itself, so. Okay. Uh, they have a little time to get out if if need be still. I thought they were near Sacramento. They are. They're in Plumas Lake, Plumas because Lake area. I can't see them emptying the whole city of Sacramento. And I was thinking it's far enough for it to be safe. Regardless. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we got um, messages that it was evacuation time. And there was, I received a, uh, a, a notice that, uh, that you could go to it where it's live telling you to evacuate. And so I called my sister in a frantic and she said, no, Barbara, there's nothing happening. And she's a good friend of the local sheriff there. And he called her and there was nothing happening at all, though there was someone live streaming it that there was actually evacuation going on. Disinfo, so, huh? Yeah, disinfo. Imagine that, right? Really? <laughs> Hard to believe. <laughs> well, not on this station, right? We get the truth. We do. We get the truth here, and so um, so. How are we on our donations so far? Well, it is the twenty first, and since we need a hundred dollars a day for this twenty eight day month, we are at sixteen seventy eight. We should be at twenty one hundred. However, we're not too far behind the curve, and much gratitude to those who have given. Uh, Just please, please help us out if you want us to be on the air. Thank you. And so we have Michael Lee Hill here today. And so, Michael, I'd like to tell our listeners a little bit about you. And from what I have is that you are an award-winning musician. And before the show, we were talking with Patrick uh, about uh, your guitars and, and that you received the Steve Vai Guitar Challenge Award. Yes, yeah, uh, that was like we're saying, you know, I think some people might know I've had contact with uh, what people would call extraterrestrials. And I found it more strange meeting Steve Vai and uh, <laughs> Joe Satriani, you know, it's kind of surreal. Earthing with the alien? Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, part of our work here um, on the Cosmic Oracle Show is we hold sacred space for people to call in and talk about their experiences. And that's one of the reasons why I was really looking forward to having you on the show is about uh, your footage on in Lake Erie, the UFOs, mm -hmm. and that you created uh, like a Billy Meyer, like Buzz, and uh, and by filming that you seem to develop an intuitive relationship with these craft, and this is in your home state of Ohio, and uh, so you catalog video after video of the UFOs over Lake Erie, and um, the phenomena consist of pulsating orbs of light, and you can see them changing colors and converging and separating and 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 uh, speaking to you. And so, it's an unexplained phenomena that dates back 150 years to the indigenous North American Indian tribes. Indeed. Yeah, that was a strange one because once I started experiencing this phenomenon here, I started to do some research. And I found some newspaper articles from, you know, the newspapers of this area's time back in the 1800s. And they said that, you know, people would see these, they thought it was some kind of illusion that there was like a ship on fire that was hovering over the horizon and they would send out you know, rescue ships and they'd get out there and not find anything. There was, you know, no hmm. wreckage, no nothing. And the Native American Indians of this time, they call them wizard lights. And they tell them, no, that's not what you think it is. Just leave it alone, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, two different articles. And then that's when I really started to realize, because um, people don't know the same area of Lake Erie, first of all, in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, if you remember those orbs of light, they were going down the freeway and they had the um, police chasing them. Steven mm -hmm. Spielberg stole, not stole, but used that actual <laughs> uh, event that happened. Those those craft for real came off of Lake Erie and went into Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, the police chased them until they ran out of gas. And uh, so then going up to 1988, a lot of people know about this Coast Guard event at a power plant here and um it's called the coast guard event because the coast guard was called they sent down two agents and they witnessed this huge triangular craft with these orbs of light coming out of it and smaller triangular craft and they made an actual uh government document you know report of what they witnessed and uh you know richard dolan has called that one of the best 10 ufo events ever because of the government the documentation backing it up but just going forward in 2003 there was a huge mass sighting here with hundreds of people calling into the local radio show it's like the biggest talk radio show it's called the uh, mike Trevisano show um and it just so happened a uh, side note is he pulled me onto the show more recent and he gave me all those phone calls on a cd into the station and um they're they've never been heard before and just so as it happens they replaced their servers and they lost everything that was in their computers so i realized i was the only one that still had a uh hmm a record of these phone calls so i'm like well crap i better get them up on youtube or something because <laughs> so i did that you can go to my youtube page it's called uh frozen hill it's all one word and i i've uploaded a lot of stuff there but um so i guess my point is people don't realize that this activity has been ongoing even back into the 1800s through 1988 through the 2003 mass sightings and it escalated until 2011 these orbs of light started coming out of the over the lake out of the lake and uh hundreds of people started going down to the shores of lake Erie and witnessing these things and actually made it to um msnbc and uh they had nick pope from the uk ministry of defense he mm -hmm. was chiming in saying yeah this seems to be the real deal it's really fascinating though um do you guys know who skinwalker ranch is sure uh, sure yeah um well they're owned by an uh, organization called uh, bigelow aerospace who makes uh, space station modules for the powers that be and whatnot. And Bigelow is also in charge of looking into new propulsion systems. So they're, they're the ones that bought the Skinwalker Ranch. So in 2011, when all this mass sightings was going on, two things happened. I think this is really fascinating. Um, first of all, I was contacted by an investigator from Bigelow Aerospace. Um, his name was Gary Hernandez. 
And he told me, we know that what you're in contact with is the real deal because it's the exact same thing we've been studying over the Skinwalker Ranch for now for 20 years. And, uh, and it's interesting because this individual still sends people my way that want to know what these orbs of light are. I'm thinking that's kind of strange having Bigelow sending people to me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it's really fascinating because one thing I learned from this investigator, and I've learned it elsewhere now as well, but he said these aren't UFOs in the way that we think of something made out of metal with nuts and bolts. And he said these have more to do with portals and time travel, mm. these orbs of light. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's an ongoing situation here. It's still ongoing to this day. And um, we can get into some of the reasons why, because I found out some inside information that there is – the largest underground base in the world was said to be here by a friend of mine who led the reverse engineering programs for the NSA. And uh, he said it's the old, oldest underground base in the world and it's not ours. So it huh. kind of explains the f activity <laughs> here. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, it's that from Skunk Works as well, that contact or... Yes, is exactly. Um, this is the gentleman. His name was A.R. Borden. And, That's right. Um, yeah, he, he became a dear friend um, and actually like a father figure to me because, you know, it was really strange when I was on the History Channel. Um, they did an episode on me called Alien Contact, and that's when they had my uh, blood work checked and all that, and it was revealed I didn't have normal human blood. But during that episode, Bill Burns says uh, – I believe that you're being contacted by a secret group of the government and given a course of study and helping you prepare to meet your ET higher selves. And at that point, it hadn't happened. And sure enough, uh, you know, about six months later, I was, you know, I was actually befriended by A.R. Borden and brought in into the fold. So I often wonder how Bill Burns even knew that because you predicted it on the History Channel show long before it ever happened. But yeah, so um, that was 2008. I worked with them, and uh, they trained us to actually use, like, telepathy to contact the incoming Anunnaki to ask for their help in uh, helping us through some of the earth changes that was happening in 2012. People think it was this big non-event. They have no idea what was happening behind the scenes to help humanity because, if, you know, if you remember Can you tell that, us about that? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, okay. yeah no, no worries. Um, what we did was uh, they taught us remote viewing, uh, telepathy uh, practices. And one of it was we were trained to go to what they called a non-physical platform. And it was a seven-member team that had been um, put together. And that was three teams of two plus A.R. Borden was what was called the waveguide. And that was, you know, like a microphone. It actually gets such a little signal, um, but it, it gets amplified before it gets sent out the cord. And that's kind of was A.R. Borden's job. He called himself the waveguide. And he would take all our collective mental energy, amp it up, and send it to the incoming. And um, so... Would you have an awareness of that when, as you oh, were yeah. doing it? Would you feel they, you lift up out of the body or how would your consciousness it, be separate what they, from the body? What they did is I had, it was really interesting how they did this. Yeah. If you picture uh, like a Star of David, you know, a Merkaba, mm -hmm. a double tetrahedron, and you just superimposed it over the United States. Every point of the triangle of the Star of David, one of us team members was physically there on the United States. So my partner was in California and every day for a month we would contact through Skype and lock our even breathing together using a metronome where we could hear um, and then it was the idea of when two or more people come together with a common goal your manifestation abilities are uh, go through the roof uh, yeah actually you know so um, what would happen was every day uh, we contacted the incoming the first part of it was an experiment to ask them, there was a lot of things happening in 2012. Um, and so it was to ask them for their help. And to do this, they first had to make sure that us team members could go to this non-physical platform and recognize our partner's energetic 
signature stamp if you want to look mm -hmm. at it that way so a lot of it was really spending a lot of time with our partners and finding out a lot about them and beginning to feel their energy field and be able to recognize them once that was accomplished and they called it a handshake then huh. it progressed to the next level of seeing if the actual incoming was receiving our uh, message and if we're getting a handshake with our Anunnaki counterpart and once that was done, uh, we had to tell them, listen, you know, we, here's the deal. Every time their planet is called Nibiru, I'm sure a lot of your listeners know this, um, but it comes through every 3,600 years, according to the records, but every 3,600 years it comes through, it's not catastrophic. You know, so what's the difference? Well, what makes sense? That's it? good to know, you know, because yeah, that's yeah. It, sometimes when you say Nibiru, people go into fear. Yeah, on that, yeah. like an automatic fear. Well, a lot of it might be cellular memory because, you know, a couple times it was <laughs> catastrophic. So, um, you know, what makes it catastrophic is where it traverses through our solar system. That if it comes through and it's between Mars and Jupiter, we have a fighting chance because we have something to buffer its effects on our tectonic plates and, you know, electromagnetic fields and whatnot. But if it comes through Mars and Earth in between, then we're screwed. And all indications were it was coming through a doomsday transit. So we had to contact them and say, help, you know. But part of the protocol was you just don't ask them for help. You bring to the table what you think is the best case scenario. And even though, obviously, they have a lot higher technology than we can even imagine, but we asked them for a change in trajectory as the planet came through the solar system to bring it between Mars and Jupiter so we'd have a fighting chance. From what I heard, it's kind of like the Anunnaki kind of laughed and they said, ah, look at the children trying to grab the wheel, <laughs> you know, to drive. And uh, it's really fascinating because uh, the end of the matter, that's not what happened. They... You know, I'm sure your listeners and you, you've heard of the Merkaba, you know, your yeah, yeah. energy field around you. Well, once your energy field is ignited in a specific way through meditation and vis visualization, um, that, you know, this field turns into a ball of light around you and pretty much you get to go anywhere in the universe free pass. You know, it's an interdimensional travel vehicle. But what people don't really know is everything has a Merkaba field around it. It doesn't matter whether it's a dog or a plant or a planet. So what, what happens when you ignite a whole planet's Merkaba field? Well, just like, uh, you know, our personal Merkaba field will become an interdimensional travel vehicle. If you, like, ignite the whole Earth's mag magnetic field, Merkaba field, the whole planet goes interdimensional. So they said when all these problems were coming through in uh, around the December timeline of 2012, that we were going to get the hell out of Dodge, but take Dodge with us. They said, truly, like, time doesn't exist the way that we think it does. And once a planet was removed out of this timeline and into the ether, one one hundredth of a second would have equaled 36 years into the future. So to us we were only gone out of this timeline for one one hundredth of a second. Most of us wouldn't have even noticed. But in that time, the Earth went interdimensional, came back out in 2036, this cosmic super wave that was said to arrive in 2012. It passed uh, some of the problem areas with like solar activity that we were tasked with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then we popped back into this timeline and truly, they had told us, we, we have went taken the whole planet into a new timeline. And I do believe the work we did is why we're experiencing this whole Mandela effect. And, you know, truly there's, we're in a different timeline that is a positive outcome for mankind and not the previous one prophesied all this time. But to get, to finish the story at the same time, after we had contacted the incoming Anunnaki, um, they, the AR Borden got a hold of us and said, listen, there's a hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, that's heading into New York, if you remember back in 2012. He said there's a lot of evidence it's being steered artificially, and they want this to happen, the transhumanists, you know, they wanted this depopulation agenda. And so they tasked the team 
to get this information to the incoming Anunnaki. And they said, listen, we know you're not weathermen, but we're going to give you um, a tasking instructions booklet. And I still have all this. I can share it with your listeners. But um, they said, um, this is all the most current data from weather satellites and whatnot. And we know you're not weathermen, but we just want you to put your eyes on this ebook. Just read it. We know you don't understand it, but they'll know what to do with the data because they're going to be somewhat looking out of your eyes. They're going to be using you as their iPhone, you know, mm. you'll be their smartphone connection. <laughs> so um, we did that and we gave them the information for the storm coming in and people don't really rec- know this, but on the other side of the United States, on the Western coast, um, in the ocean, there was uh, earthquake, earthquake Charlotte. And that created a 20-foot wall of water, a tsunami that was heading right for Hawaii. And in real time, because they knew they had like about three hours time before the, this wall of water was to hit Hawaii. So in real time, they took all the people in Hawaii, took them to higher ground and live on CNN and everything. They awaited mm-hmm. this wall of water to arrive. And on both coasts, those storms lost all intensity um, before they landed. But That's what caused the death of A.R. Borden, because the last time I talked to him, he said our mission was successful. We did stop these events from Mm -hmm. that would have been catastrophic for mankind. But his last words to me was, well, we pissed off the wrong people, too, that they had a a depopulation agenda, these transhumanists. Mm -hmm. To them, they'd go down into their bunkers and leave us to go down with the sinking ship. And then once the smoke had cleared, they would rise back up and have their little utopia and not have to worry about us crazy humans uh, misusing unlimited free energy and whatnot. So, uh, you know, about three months later, he had already, they came down with a really rare cancer and uh, was dead, you know, and uh, like I said, he was kind of like my f- a father figure. Uh. So it really, uh, really pissed me off what, what, how they played dirty pool, you know? Yeah. Oh, but, um, I'm so sorry to hear that. It's 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 sad when someone that you love so much and and uh, is so yeah. alive, life passes, even though you know that you have them here spiritually and you have that connection with them still. It's it's still Barbara, uh, <laughs> the craziest thing I can even tell you is I don't even still have them here. In the spiritual, A.R. Borden has returned into my life as a a whole other incarnation. And he explained to me, truly, he's a Pleiadian representative. See, I didn't know this when he was alive. A.R. Borden is James of the Wingmakers. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Wingmakers. No, can can you let our listeners fill us in on that? Yeah, check out wingmakers.com and specifically go and read the Dr. Neruda interviews. Um, what this was, was a, see, the Pleiadians are very involved with the Anunnaki, intertwined, I should say. And people don't understand this, that, you know, their culture, their king, his name was Anu, A-N-U. And he, his wife, he took on a wife that was Pleiadian. She was not Anunnaki. And she was a Pleiadian queen. And they had a child. And this was the first time that a hybrid was born into the Anunnaki bloodline himself, and his name was Ea. And so Ea was half Pleiadian on his mother's side and half Anunnaki, half Syrian on on his father's side. So, you know, this was Prince Ea. He was, his father was the king. He was raised to take the throne. But later on in uh, life, Anu severed that relationship with the Pleiadian female and took on an Anunnaki uh, wife and they had another child which would have been Ia's younger uh, brother and his name was Yahweh. That sounds familiar right? Or Enlil. Yeah. Um, or Enlil, so, yes. Yeah, Enlil is Yahweh I'm finding out. But um, so the Pleiadians are a big part of this and uh, they are said to be a very high race um, in the Bible they call them the Elohim um, but so the, the point is that A.R. Borden was the Pleiadian ambassador here on this planet. Um, A.R. Borden was this person 
known as James. So when you re read the Wingmakers, Dr. Neruda okay. interviews, when you come across the words, uh, they call him 15 in that because, you know, he was the 15th person to hold that position within the NSA, within, you know, Skunk Works, Lockheed Martin. So it's that simple. He was just the 15th person, so they called him 15. But that is A.R. Borden. So what I want to tell you is this person that became like a father figure to me um, because of the work when we went up against the transhumanists and, you know, uh, he knew he was in trouble and he ended up dying. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. at that, what I found out is he had five other physical human incarnations happening simultaneously at the I exact love that. time I on love this planet. That. <laughs> yeah, so it's like you can't I, stop. <laughs> I, read that in her, I read that in her death. I, I love that. So continue. Sorry. Well, what happened? Oh, it's all good. So one of his other incarnations is a Native American Indian because actually um, A.R. Borden himself, you know, 15 was uh, Cherokee, um, which mm. that's prominent. And we can talk about that later. But um, so after he passed away, yeah, I mourned. He was like a father figure. Then all of a sudden, I meet this young 20-year-old uh, uh, at a Native American Indian ceremony. And before I know it, he starts talking about the wingmakers. We start talking. And sure enough, we're best friends now. And he, it's, he isn't A.R. Borden, but he said he is A.R. Borden's other incarnation and vice versa. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he said what happened to him was when AR passed away in 2013, it was almost like AR's consciousness awoke within this other individual. And it's strange because now I've got to actually finish some conversations that I had with AR Borden and deep conversations too. Like no one else would ever have known what the hell I was even talking sure. about, you know. Uh, so, so do you think he was able to pass, AR Borden was able to pass it on to him? before he left the planet or well i'll tell you what he said to me specifically he said the pleiadians okay. of of such a high frequency and energy that um pretty much they knew in the first place uh that i needed this pleiadian influence in my life so it was made through, they call them event strings, you know, like almost arranging multi-dimensional chessboard moves behind the scenes to, huh. you know, to, to align people. And mm -hmm. um, so they brought A.R. Borden into my life. And, but when he passed away, even then they could have, they can time travel, right? So they're like, well, we sure. got to make sure we, we have another human that's going to, you know, if they kill one, we'll bring another one. They can't stop it, you know? So um, that's what happened. And that this only happened last June when I met this individual. So mm. for, uh, you know, years I mourned the loss of my friend. Um, and then all of a sudden, to absolute, to me, there's no doubt that he is James. He is A.R. Borden. He's a, but he is himself. He's got his own personality <laughs> for sure. Uh, but man, talk, talking about a—I I don't think we can swear here, but I'll, we'll call it a, a, mind, a mind freak. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a little hard yeah. to deal with, you know. But like, to assimilate it, right? It would, could blow your mind a little bit, I would think, at first, until you uh, get yeah. activated, it, right? Yeah. And then you can have fun so with it, and then then you can then actually work and heal with it, right? I just, you know, I feel fortunate now. A matter of fact, I'm going to be spending, I'm leaving Thursday for Colorado for uh, the next Star Knowledge Conference, and this individual will be there. So I'm going to be spending the next week with him, and he's already, he's come up and stayed with me at my house for a week, and we just, you know, it's right away, um, he just felt like a long lost friend, um, and it gets a lot deeper than that anyhow. Are you familiar with the whole Anunnaki mythos? No, but let's let our, I know our listeners would love to hear it. We have a, a gamut. We go from those, from the very beginners. A lot of times on my show, we have a lot of beginners that are just kind of stepping their foot in the water for the first time. And then we have uh -huh. like, like Patrick and I, the old folks have been around for years too, uh, listening. So, so we are, have this array of, of different 
uh, aspects and perspectives. But if, so if you could kind of give us the basic of the Anunnaki would be wonderful. Cool. Well, uh, they said, that, as we were saying earlier, they are the inhabitants of this planet. It's truly a part of our solar system, but it orbits way out in the deep outer space. It only comes back through our part of the neighborhood every 3,600 years. What's interesting is uh, your listeners can go and type in Planet X found uh, January 2016, and you'll find out that all through, they've already released to the mass media, they they our scientists know this planet is there and it exists. So it's not, it's not this crazy conspiracy theory anymore. They know it's there, but every time it comes through, they had through their own evolutionary process, kind of destroyed their own ozone the way that we're destroying ours. And they needed gold because they would powderize it into a really fine, like mist and with other elements as well. But they would put it up into their atmosphere to shield their planet from solar radiation when it came through our part of the universe. And not only that, they found if they um, powderized gold and turned it into uh, monoatomic gold, it's called, and inhale it, that gold, it makes all your, uh, like, neurons fire, you know, your DNA. It's, uh, it's the highest capacitance for transmission of energy so have you uh, tried it have you tried you know, it yeah when i <laughs> i said you know when i when i first met the anunnaki in 2008 this individual had a vial of it and took it out and he put he put it on his his like how like if you look at your hand where that cup of your thumb and your forefinger mm. right there he put some on his hand and like kind of made a line out of it and said would you would you like to do a line of this gold. And I'm like, well, I guess if an Anunnaki asked you to, if you want to snort some gold, um, you know, what the hell? So yeah, I tried it. Uh, you know, I want to say in one end, I felt like I didn't feel anything. It's not, there's no buzz involved or anything like that. And I didn't really feel any, any difference, but I can say later on is when I did meet uh, this individual that Marduk. So maybe it did do something, you know, but, uh, uh, yeah, but so what would happen was because they needed this gold and by the way, that's why, um, this gold kept them rejuvenated on a cellular mm -hmm. level and very long lifetime. So not only did they use it to, um, buffer their planet from solar radiation, but they used it to re keep themselves rejuvenated. So when they came through our part of the solar system, they realized, wow, this this planet has huge deposits of gold, mm -hmm. meaning Earth. So they set up mining operations here um, for, I think it was about 400,000 years before mankind ever set foot on this planet. So right there is kind of strange. Like, are they really aliens? If they were here 400,000 years before <laughs> we were, you know, uh, maybe we should and, and, be calm. Yeah. And they found yeah. it in the ocean mainly, right? Is that if I, if I remember right? And the gold edge is everywhere here. They said in Africa, mm -hmm. there's some huge, uh, like, uh, Michael Tellinger is pretty much an right. uh, uh, expert on that, that they found these huge mining operations um, in Africa. But um, what had happened was, I don't know if you guys ever seen um, the movie Interstellar with Matthew McConaughey. Um, they got into this, this time differ differential kind of thing happening. And the easiest way to understand this is Einstein had this thing called uh, the twins paradox. And he said what happens is like, say you got two twins on the planet and one twin gets in his spaceship and goes off and travels at near the speed of light for five years, turns around, comes back to Earth. Well, his Earthbound brother will have been dead for like 500 years. That um, Einstein said the faster you travel through the ether, you're actually how you perceive time truly changes. And um, so to think about this, each brother, like the one in his spaceship, he's got a wristwatch on and it's still clicking one second equals one second. For him, he doesn't feel any type of time change. But to his brother on the planet, his wristwatch is still clicking one second equals one second. There's not a problem until they 
try to come back into each other's timelines. Mm -hmm. Then the the brother that was traveling very at a fast velocity through the ether. Um, well, take this, and they said, as crazy as this sounds, they've actually proven it with the speed that even jets fly. Um, that they could put an atomic clock into a jet airplane and have a ground-based counterpart and have them sync together. But once the jet went up and flew, you know, a couple hundred miles an hour faster than its ground-based counterpart, when it lands, there'll be a few milliseconds off on their atomic clocks. So really to wrap your head around this, you need to realize that planets have their own speed through the ether. And so when you go to another planet that's traveling faster around the sun than one of the other planets, you experience time differently. They said, for instance, right now, if it was possible to go through a stargate and, you know, walk into a room, walk out the other door and you're on Mars right now, you know, mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is if you try to get on your uh, super walkie talkie and, and communicate back to the earth, you would be communicating to earth in the 1950s. <laughs> um, right now, you know, it's kind of mm -hmm. hurts your mm -hmm. head, but you know, because of this, the Anunnaki that were coming here to mine gold, um, they were having problems with this time shift that when they went home, their loved ones were aged differently. And so they were actually going to have civil war. Um, they're the Anunnaki that came here to mine the gold. They were called the heroes because it's truly like a death sentence. They looked at it mm -hmm. as to come here and do this. So, uh, you know, this is how the whole creation of mankind enters into this because a lot of people say, well, they just go around creating slave labor. And that's not the case. It was a do or die situation for them. They thought if we could have some help with the toil and labor, maybe it would alleviate the situation that's leading to civil war. You know, the king of New was... Mm -hmm amassing troops to come here and take care of the, you know, the heroes. And um, so it was Ia who said, well, what if we got some help with the toil and labor? And since there was no indigenous life form at that point of its evolution that was capable of helping us, it's like, no matter how much you love a chimpanzee, um, <laughs> go and try to get some chimpanzees to help you mine gold. You know, it's not going to work out real well. So they mm -hmm. thought, what if we jump-started their evolution and mixed our DNA with theirs and created uh, a jump-started human vessel that would have the awareness and consciousness to even take an order or help, mm -hmm. you know? And but be able it, to survive on the planet still. Indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at this point, what had happened was... Uh, you know, this experiment happened, and a lot of people say they created us as slave labor. But from what I understand, it was more like pampered pets. You know, mm -hmm. and even the Sumerian word of where mankind was brought onto this planet was Eden. Well, that sounds familiar, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it was truly Edenic. You know, we there was no starvation, no homeless. Uh, if you wanted to go talk to an Anunnaki, you went to the pyramid and there's a lot of depictions of like a 15 foot tall individual with like normal five, six foot tall individuals coming up to it. You know, they could go and, and know that they're not alone. Um, but uh, so it wasn't so was like... There a, was there a hierarchy in the system or was it in a, like a circular indigenous, uh, you know, a communication with no hierarchy for the people? No, it was definitely, there was hierarchy at this point. Yeah. It was, okay. uh, you know, you had the pharaohs, you know, the actual Anunnaki, and then, you know, the, the humans. But, you know, truly, when you read the Sumerian clay tablets, like when we fast forward and we get to the flood, they were devastated. You know, they, some of the Anunnaki, they, they dropped to their knees and wept because they loved us, some of them. Some of them looked at, at us as pesky gnats, you know. <laughs> you could get into that too. But um, so uh, uh, the, the whole thing with people saying, well, they just go around creating slave labor, that's not actually correct. And um, uh, Can I you know, ask what the time zone is for that, that you're talking about? When yes. yay and the the labor and can you give us kind of a time period yeah. before the flood would be great? 
Yeah, it goes back. Like I said, they were here like 400,000 years before mankind ever set here. But from what I understand, um, you know, about 50,000 years ago uh, is when the first experiments to bring this help, you know, uh, homo sapien onto the scene. But truly, um, you know, as I said, this one brother, the first brother, his name was Ia. And he was known as the water bearer. He was always depicted with water coming out of his shoulders or carrying pitchers or buckets of water. And uh, being known as the water bearer, he is the uh, prototype of like Poseidon, um, Neptune. Um, mm-hmm. So, and the age uh, of Aquarius, right? Yes, yes. The guy holding the bucket of water, right? It <laughs> might well call it the age of Inky. Um, uh, <laughs> So your listeners know, though, Inky is not a name. A lot of people confuse this. It's a title. It's kind of like Dalai Lama. Um, N means Lord and Kai means Earth. So uh, his title was Lord of the Earth, Inky, but his name was Ia. Um, but anyhow, uh, so Edgar Casey uh, nailed this, by the way. A lot of people know that Edgar Casey did a lot of prophecy on you know, the Sphinx and the Atlanteans and the Hall of Records under the paw and all that. But a lot of people don't realize that he also prophesied what happened to the Atlanteans. And he's mm-hmm. being proven ex- absolutely correct. And that was, you know, Atlantis was broken up in three earth changes, which gets into this timeline we're talking about. Um, mm-hmm. And he called the Atlanteans the Poseidians. So it shows you, this is Inky. This is Inky's place of home. <laughs> uh, so 52,000 years ago, first earth change, and the continent of Atlantis sat between the North American continent and the European continent. And the first wave of migration out of Atlantis went to the right and they migrated into, you know, European continent. And then 27,000 years ago was the biblical flood event. And this is a huge timeline for the story of the Anunnaki. Um, But before we get into that, I'll just finish the timeline. 27,000 years ago, Anunnaki scientists realized the crust is going to slip and we're going to have what they call a pole shift. And um, so there's another migration out of Atlantis to the right. And then 10,500 years ago was the last breakup that totally took out the continent. And for the first time, the Atlanteans went to the left and came up into the bottom of the North American continent. And the first indigenous people they met were the Mayans. And even the Mayans said, yeah, this big white dude, Cody Quetzal showed up and showed us how to make pyramids and, you know, the Mayan calendar and whatnot. But then from that point forward, you know, they intermingled there for a brief moment in time for a thousand years or so. But then once the darkness started setting in, because we'll have to back up because that middle event with 27,000 years, there was an experiment that was put into place by the Anunnaki to make mankind evolve in a consciousness level faster by making us experience our own mental energy unbiasedly. You know, if you put out love filled frequencies, then you got back love fill frequencies multifold but if you put out fear and doubt and lower vibrations then you get that that back in spades mm-hmm. and truly they understand that thoughts have an electromagnetic reality and you know energy and energy can't be created or destroyed it needs to be transmuted so how do you transmute a negative thought form well you live it right it comes up in your own personal reality for you to choose love over fear and transmute those energies mm-hmm. into their higher octaves but um right. Uh, yeah, but that you was build a, a relationship with it. Yeah, and then it's done. Once you know, if you don't transmute it, the same thing keeps cycling through your life over and over again. You keep saying, "Why the hell does this crap keep <laughs> happening to me?" You know, it's because that, that thought form hasn't been transmuted yet. You know, right, but um, right. so uh, that's twenty-seven thousand years ago. So you can see when we're talking about when they met the Mayans, this experiment to ex- accelerate our per blowing through our shadow work was well underway. So once this darkness started settling in into the Mayans and the Mayans, you know, say, hey, you know, maybe we should start sacrificing people. That would really make them happy. You know, the mound builders are like, wait a minute, I think it's time to keep going. (laughs) 
straight up through the continent. Well, they truly did become known as what we know of now as the Native American mound builder culture, which predates the Native American Indians by thousands of years, by the way. So Edgar Cayce had said um, that the Atlanteans became what is known as the mound builders and then eventually intertwined into the Iroquois uh confederacy of native american indian tribes and then people don't might not know this but the cherokee are iroquois dna cousins it's the same bloodline mm -hmm. and then they finally the final place of this intermingling of the bloodline was into the sioux native american mm -hmm. indians which is the lakota dakota and nakota, nakota. indian yeah, so the bloodline's still here, which is interesting. And what really gets fascinating with this is to back up all of this. In 1998, they found a brand new DNA haplogroup. And haplogroups are just like with DNA testing now. They can go backwards in time and see exactly where a DNA type came from. And up until 1998, might have been 97. I, I'll have to check on that, but um, it's not that long ago is the point. Mm -hmm. um, they found a brand new haplogroup, and up until this point, they had all the haplogroups here for the Native American Indians as haplogroup A, B, C, and D. And all those tribes followed the migration route that we've all been told. They came in through the Asian migration route and all that. No problems. Our history books are good. But now haplogroup X2A shows up. And people can go to Google and just type in haplogroup, all one word, X2A. Mm -hmm. You'll find some info. It's really not a lot of it out there yet, but because uh, it doesn't go along with what we've been told. Because what they found was haplogroup X2A only exists on this planet in the tall skeletal remains that have been removed out of these mounds. And uh, usually giant stature, by the way, you know, mm -hmm. nine to 15 mm -hmm. foot tall individuals. And but 3% of the Native American Indians still have this haplogroup X2A still to this day. But this is an interesting talking point because they're not giants anymore. So mm -hmm. I, I believe it's proof that the genetic work has never ended. It's still ongoing, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, so it's there also a an Egyptian link as well if i remember right um, yeah exactly because what you find is not only it, and mind you it could be much higher percentages in the native american indians still to this day but not many native american indians have had their blood checked and looked for this you know dna marker so it could be much higher but we know at least native american indians still to this day have this bloodline uh mm -hmm. the mound builders skeletal remains has this DNA. But then when you go backwards, you can see backwards in time when you find the largest concentration of that DNA type, then you found their home base, right, in the past. And it just happens to be the hills of Galilee. You know, huh. it's, it's one of the lost tribes of Israel. And this gets weird to me because, you know, I've been kind of attacked recently saying I'm promoting God's chosen people, uh, you know, and all this. I'm like, I'm not religious in any normal way, and the lost tribe of Israel, I hate to say to me, means nothing because i it's not part of my belief system. I, I'm just following the evidence where it goes. You do with it whatever you want to do with it. You know, If you want to look at it fearfully, I, I can't help that. But um, uh, to me, it's just actually finding out hidden history of what's been kept from us. And uh, I've, I've got a pretty good grip on now why it was kept from us because there was this experiment right you know mm -hmm. we're we're saying that this experiment was put into place to make us experience our own mental energy in an accelerated fashion well the anunnaki decided well to do this experiment let's let's break off into two camps one we'll call it dark and it would be their spiritual role to look out over the mass consciousness and if someone's vibrating fear they come in and make give you the chance to experience your own dark thought form up close and personal, you know, and in hopes really that you'll change it and choose love over mm -hmm. fear. But then there's team light who is whispering in our ears and giving us uh, insight into sacred geometry and music and culture that leads the human spirit into higher realms. So both of these groups are working and they told me when I met them, they said, this was, they said, their own succession of kingship and how they relate to humanity was based on the processional cycle. And I didn't know anything about the processional cycle at this time. Actually, 
this was in 2008. I didn't know what an Anunnaki was. You know, there was no ancient aliens on TV or anything. So I was like, I don't know what the hell's going on, but I'm listening, <laughs> you know. Um, well, it's quite a download if you're not used to it. It's it's a lot to kind of wrap your mind around if, it, if when you first encounter it. Yeah, yeah. It was funny because when I got home from this meeting, I contacted A.R. Borden. And at this time, I didn't know. He was an Anunnaki, you know. I'm like, <laughs> hey, I met these people. They said they're Anunnaki. He's like, oh shit. <laughs> oh wait a minute. I asked him like, oh, you know anything about these people? It's funny in hindsight. Um, but uh, uh, so where 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 were we? Um, the, the kingship, the processional cycle. Oh, processional cycle. Yeah, they said this, this <laughs> experiment to accelerate human conscious evolution. They said the minute. The very second, the first second that we entered out of the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius would signal a new time of succession of kingship for the Anunnaki and how they relate to humanity. And um, they said we've made it. They, in their own words were mankind has earned the right to be treated as equals. And um, uh, so... Yeah, it was all based around the processional cycle. And what they told me was the, the second we entered into the age of Aquarius, this experiment to accelerate human conscious evolution was over. We would either have learned our lessons or we wouldn't have. And if we wouldn't have, we would have got the doom and gloom ending to this story. And, and another but, possible, another flood or <laughs> yeah, start yeah. all over. Well, kind people of, are going to find out. Man, I'm going to spill the beans right now. And I, I don't really talk about this because, man, it is a frightening subject. But I can tell you, I guess it's a good thing to get it out there because it's not what people are going to be told and it's not what people think. But, you know, the ending of the story is on its way. And if we wouldn't have learned, we would have had this meteorite impact the Earth. And it's coming and we'll be here in 2036. And um, uh, what has happened with this is I partnered with David Sarita on a film. And we had this gentleman named Boyd Bushman from uh, Lockheed Martin. He was a senior scientist who just spilled the beans. You know, he showed us working anti-gravity. Um, he uh, let us film some of the documents and whatnot. But during this uh, interview, he, he points up and there's this picture of this meteorite. And he said, you know, we know this is coming. We're tracking it. Um, it's going to come between the Earth and the moon in 2029. And it's not going to be debatable, right? You know, um, and, and then it's going to get locked into Earth's orbit and it's going to cycle twice around the planet each time with a decaying orbit. And in the third pass around, which will be 2036, um, by the way, this was interesting because I told you the work I did with AR Borden, they ignited mm -hmm. the Earth's uh, Merkaba field. They said they took the, the planet to 2036. So I don't know why that's important, but I, I do know it's not coincidence. But um, mm -hmm. so they said Lockheed Martin knows it's going to strike somewhere in Siberia and it's going to be civilization ending event really it's and david was shocked he's like wow like do you know how bad it's going to be he said well it'll be it's going to be bad but he said we don't know the trajectory and the speed yet precisely uh so it depends on what angle it comes in and whatnot so what i can tell you now fast forwarding is the native american indians have released to the world the masses that they have prophecy of this meteorite coming in and it will be here in 2036 and mm -hmm. uh to them they said they got a message from spirit that the moon had said she would take the hit for us and she would huh. make sure she was between this incoming object and the earth and that she would take the hit and in their prophecy the moon cracks in half and mm -hmm. still three big chunks of the moon come down and strike the planet it's still horrific but it's uh it's survivable. So mm -hmm. that's what the Native American Indians have brought into play. Now I can tell you recently, because of my work with the elders, they've been doing ceremony and contacting spirit. And uh, they were shown that picture of this planet coming in and using a, I guess you could think of it as an extraterrestrial, huge, like anti-gravity net, you know, and that this, it, it almost looked to them like, this big meteorite came in and got hit and slowed down by 
an etheric spider web kind of and then you know was released slowly into orbit and truly what i have come to know and believe is that this is truly earth's second moon being flown in just like the first one was a lot of people huh. know that the the moon is not what we think it is it's hollow mm -hmm. for the first mm -hmm. thing they said when they landed on it it rang like a bell for three hours mm -hmm. they had si seismographs you know on the moon so this is exactly the same process that was used before and truly you know like i said i've become friends with a pleiadian uh uh, ah, so that's the sign. We're, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're up for break. We'll be right back and stay right where you are. Thanks for joining us today. This is your host, Barbara Jean Lindsay, and welcome back to the Cosmic Oracle Show. We want to thank you for tuning in today, and we have with us uh, a wonderful, mesmerizing uh, guest, uh, Michael Lee Hill, and you can reach him on uh, at michaelleehill.net. He also has a YouTube channel called Frozen Hill, and you can reach him there. And we have been talking about Oh uh, boy, shadow work and mound builders and Atlanteans and and uh, Anunnaki and the Native American connection and Edgar Casey and the Atlantean connection and we were just having I'm having a really good time. I don't know about you, Michael, but I'm having a great time. <laughs> uh, me too. Man. I uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, it's nice to talk with like-minded individuals. <laughs> well, Barbara. and. Barbara, we seem yes. to have a caller. Oh, okay. Um, let's take that caller now. 702, are you with us? Yes, it's DB405. Hi, Barbara and Pat. Hi. Hi, it's been a while. Glad I you know. could join us today. <laughs> How are you? I am well. Yeah, there, there's been uh, changes going on between the six months since we last talked. Yeah, and changes. Do you have I got it. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, do you have a question for Michael Lee Hill? Oh, is it for Michael Lee or is it for you? I didn't know it was a personal reading from him or from you. Oh, no, it's it's uh, Michael Lee Hill is talking about his experiences as an Anunnaki oh. and as a a uh, spokesperson for, and he will be the lead speaker the for the upcoming Star Knowledge Conference, uh, the 11 11 oh, Star Teachings and solar eclipse ceremony in February 26th this weekend in Golden, Colorado. Because uh, I, you don't do readings, do you, Michael? No, I don't. Yeah. Oh, okay. So usually okay, well, we, I do apologize. Go ahead, no, go ahead. no, no, don't. Yeah. Oh, usually no we, worries. Usually we do do readings, but when I uh, have a guest on, I, 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 I like to hear what they have to say as well. That's what so, I thought. <laughs> is that okay? Or can, can, it, it's, can it keep until next week's show? Is that cool? Yes. Yes, okay. of course. Uh, but stay with us and, and tune in. And uh, okay. we, love, we love having you on the show for sure. Okay. And so okay. also for all of those that are listening in, uh, we do ask that you go to freedomslips.com, find that donate button, and uh, please give a donation. Be generous. Keep us on the air. No one gets paid for uh, any of the shows that we do, that we host, or the producers, or all the time that Mike uh 
Ringley puts in on the show and his family. So uh, thank you from the bottom of our hearts uh, to yours uh, for your generosity and keeping us on the air. And you just have to go to freedomslips.com. And so we're back. And so, Michael, we were like in the middle of of um, talking about the Haplo group and the X2A as mm-hmm. well. Would you like to? And and I know that you discovered that this is part of your blood uh, as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and how that came to be? Yeah, or, or it, wherever you want to take it to, Michael. No, that's perfect because okay. uh, it's interesting because I was adopted um, mm-hmm. at a couple years, I mean, a couple days old. So I never knew my uh, heritage. I never knew my nationality. Um, most people would say, oh, dude, I think you're Italian. I'm like, all right, whatever, <laughs> you know. But um, because of being on the History Channel and them revealing this unknown blood anomaly, they told me, if you know how to get in touch with your biological parents, you should to see if this is some kind of hereditary thing, you know, and maybe they know something about it. So I, uh, I did the work and I actually ended up meeting my biological mother for the first time in late 2008. And I met my two half sisters as well for the first time. So that was beautiful. But this is for the first time when I uh, found out that my great grandfather was pure blood Seneca Iroquois. And I never knew I had Native American Indian uh, heritage at this point. I found out um, on my mother's side, I'm Iroquois, but on my father's side, I'm Erie Montauk. And you find out Montauk means Pharaoh. And uh, this truly is tied in with Egypt, all of this, because what you find out is, you know, this bloodline was here in East Lake, Ohio, before Egypt. And the first written Ten Commandments ever found on this planet, written in ancient Hebrew, was found in uh, Newark, Ohio, not Egypt. And it was removed out of one of these mound sites. There's another, uh, I guess you call it a Jewish menorah that was built into a mound structure here in Ohio well before Egypt. And um, so what you find out is, you know, when they left Egypt, you know, as one of the lost tribes of Israel, as, you know, myth has it now, that um, they just came back home. They came back here to Ohio. But um, so at this point, I found out I had Native American Indian heritage, but... I was thinking, man, wouldn't it be great to be able to meet all the chiefs, the elders and the (laughs) grandmothers and, you know, like find out what they know about, you know, with years of contact with these star beings. Wouldn't that be fantastic? And my next thought was, good luck with that. You know, how the hell would I ever (laughs) be able to meet all the chiefs or something? Then all of a sudden I was speaking at this conference called Angels and Aliens and the keynote speaker was Chief Golden Light Eagle. And he is the spiritual leader and the chief of the Dakota Sioux Native American Indian tribe. And uh, he walked up to me out of nowhere and he said, Michael, I need the Atlanteans. I need the Nephilim. Uh, ambassadors at the Star Knowledge Conferences, would you come and speak? I'm just looking around like, oh, what the hell's going on? You know, <laughs> how did you know? But um, so he took me under the wing and his wing, and you know, I've been doing these Star Knowledge Conferences, and sure enough, I've got to meet like the Mayan elders and the Aztec and all the chiefs and grandmothers, because people might not know it's the fem- the females have the largest uh, amount of authority within the Native American mm-hmm. Indians. It goes up to the chief, but then the grandmothers are the ones who have the sil- final say. So it's been a real blessing now to actually be able, and so people know what the Star Knowledge Conferences are. Um, 20 years ago, Chief Golden Light Eagle got permission to, from Spirit that it was time for them to start sharing all the wisdom and knowledge that they've gained from thousands of years of contact with what they call star beings, you know. Matter of fact, Chief's really prominent. He was on Ancient Aliens, and there's a video out on YouTube. People can just type in Chief Golden Light Eagle, type in Ancient Aliens, and you'll find this clip. It was him yelling at the producers not to call them aliens. <laughs> like, if you call them aliens, they're not going to show up. You've already, well, like, started off with a negative connotation right what off the does bat. He like, what does he suggest we call them? Star brothers and sisters. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He said, if you start right off the bat, like with separation, you know, that you're not going to get very far with them. Um, so we're family. So, so yes, indeed. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I look at it as this whole big multiverse. We're all family, mm-hmm. you know, within it. But um, so they started doing these conferences and every place it's in a different location. But every single time I can tell you there's either a huge event happening like this one coming up this weekend it's time to be on when this eclipse happens um and most of the other times it's during an equinox and there'll be a mound site close and then he, all the all of us because uh, i've been brought in as kind of like the iroquois ambassador um to these events and, and all I, of us, I i understand they call you grandfather yeah, grandfather means he, uh, um, and uh, I didn't even know this because when I met the Anunnaki back in 2008, they told me you were once known as Ia, uh, the water bearer, and believe me, if I didn't know who the Anunnaki was, I was like, what, Ia, okay, what what the hell is that about? It's like, kind of like, I've, I've said it before, but, you know, it was almost like someone come up, coming up to me and going, hey, man, you're the Easter bunny. <laughs> well, all right, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, so it came full circle, like 2008 is when the Anunnaki told me these things. And then last June at this ceremony, uh, I started getting all these synchronicities from spirit regarding grandfather. And uh, the first one was someone come like for the ceremony, they went and cut down a tree and it's for a Native American Indian Sundance ceremony. And uh the tree is a big part of the ceremony. So the day before the event is called tree day and they go do a ceremony and sing and take down a tree and then take it back to the grounds to use during the ceremony. Well, on the way back to the cars to go back to the Sundance grounds, someone grabbed me by the shoulder and said, Hey, they're having a grandfather meeting in the woods and your presence is requested. And I'm thinking, what the hell? So I go, and it's right where they cut down the tree, and there's another young girl there. She was a sun dancer. She pointed into the trees, and she said, they're in there. You can't miss them. So I went in, and it was not an easy uh, journey into that brush. It was pretty thick. I got in there, and there's no one there. I was like, what the hell? Am I being Indian punked, you know? (laughs) And so I got myself out of there. Like I said, a lot of thicket and a lot of thorns and stuff. My legs were all cut up. I'm like, what is going on? Like, why would they tell me to go into the woods and there's no one in there? So we got back to the Sundance grounds and this little girl comes up to me and she says, spirit told me to tell you that the reason you didn't see the grandfathers was they were in spirit form. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. How did you know? You know, and she goes, "Oh, spirit told me," and she kind of giggled and hopped off. And I was like, "Wait a minute, man, this is getting strange." So now, fast forward, I'm talking with one of the grandmothers, and this lady came up and talked for about five minutes with her. And at the end, she said, "Thank you, grandmother, so much for your time." And oh, by the way, is this your grandson? She said, "No, this is the grandfather." Again, I'm thinking, "What's this grandfather stuff, man? I don't have no kids, <laughs> you know." Don't even have a girlfriend. I don't see how this is happening. <laughs> and uh, so a little bit later on, um, the whole culmination to this happened because one of the other grandmothers pulled up and she asked me um, if if I would go for a ride with her. And she wanted to go over the Sioux history of how the bloodline came into this uh, continent. See, they know, by the way, mm-hmm. which is very fascinating. And they um, have known, and they have known, right? It's oh, never... yeah. Mm-hmm. They just couldn't say, you know, not too long ago, even if they talked in their ancient language, up until 1978, people don't know. It was Jimmy Carter who put in the Freedom of Religious Act in 1978. That wasn't that long ago. Any time prior to that, even if they were caught speaking in their ancient tongue, they'd be ripped out of their family and put in their jail and prison for 30 years, never to be seen again. And there's still a lot of Native American Indian families that are reeling and still suffering from this because you know their grandfathers or their mothers or their fathers or their children were ripped away from them and uh, the grandmother told me she said um, because this gets into this team dark and light we were talking about and them all working on humanity it's very team dark has a game book and they want to win and so they knew these ones of the bloodline are the ones that if they awoke to their true power and kind of reclaimed their I am, you know, stood up in their own sovereignty, that these are the ones that could take down the 
evil oil and banking cabal through, you know, who they are. So they would hunt them down. Like if they found someone that they was rumored to be one of these ancients, yeah, it didn't end well for them. Mm -hmm. um, would would this be like the the Rainbow Warriors? Are you talking of that, or is it something? Yes. Matter of okay. fact, I'm glad you know that because after all this was said and done, and um, you know, I learned about you know the ending of that story with grandfather was. This grandmother told me, you know, she goes, I want to talk to you about the dialect of the Sioux. She said the same word will end in, like in Lakota, that word will end in L.A. She said, let's use the word grandfather, for instance. And I'm like, all right, here we go with grandfather again, you know. And um, uh, she said the word for grandfather in Lakota ends in L.A. The word for grandfather in Dakota ends in D.A. And the word for uh, grandfather in Nakota ends in N.A. And uh, so then I find out that the word for grandfather in Dakota is E.A.D.A. -A. So then I found out grandfather means E.A. You know, so it was a full confirmation of what they told me. And by the way, back in 2008, when they told me I was Ia Inky, well, I was that person. I was known as that person in the past. I I'm pretty much feel like Mike most days now. But um, uh, they said that, you know, I was known as Ia Inky. So I, I put out a, a test to them. I said, listen, if you are who you say you are, then put the name Inky into a crop circle. I'm a student of the subject. I go every day and see what new crop circles have showed up. I can guarantee you I will see it, and that will be my confirmation that you are who you say you are. The next uh, thought that entered my head was, what a silly request. You know, can you imagine a big crop circle with Inky written in cursive? It's like, what the hell is that going to prove? <laughs> but th my next thought was, well, You'll figure it out. If you are who you say you are, figure out a way to do it that's interesting, that's not inky written in cursive, you know. And then I got really cocky. I said, you know, while you're at it, encode it with something only I would be able to decode. Then I'll really know. Wow, well, that's a double challenge there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just let it go then, you know. And this was probably the beginning of 2009 when I put this challenge out to them. Well, sure enough, in 2011 in Italy, a crop circle showed up. And first of all, it's based off of a seven-pointed star. And you find out the seven-pointed star is the uh, symbol for the Cherokee Nation, for one. And uh, it is the Babylon uh, world map that sits in a museum right now is the map is a seven-pointed star. So it's interesting because Babylon was Anunnaki. And here you got, you know, this crop circle showing up that is based on, you know, this uh, Babylonian symbol, the seven-pointed star. But what's interesting with this is I began to become a student of the subject called cymatics, which is the science of making the invisible visible. Um, some people might know, they've seen where they take a big metal plate and they put sand on it. And the, the, this metal plate is tuned with a bow. And when you bow it, you know, you watch the sand dance and geometry is formed. And it's not random. Every single time you hit specific frequencies, specific geometry is formed. Well, that has evolved now till they have a big container of water and it's in a big tripod so there's no vibration that can get in it. And then it's got a waveform generator pumping sound through it. And then there's a high-tech camera to record what's happening on the top of the water. And uh, what you find out is they've been guiding us into what are the most cosmic harmonious frequencies, which we can get into this, but it's 432 hertz. And mm -hmm. it's strange because our musical standard has been changed to the A note resonating at 440 hertz. And what you find using this exact same scientific technology, if you put 440 through it, no geometry is formed. It looks like a puddle. Um, but if you just back it off to 432, it's almost like you've taken the focus on a camera and brought it into focus. And uh, So the 440 can, takes away our energy, it, right? And yeah, it's pretty controls much controls our vibration. It's the most disharmonious frequency. That well, can be that's not fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, I think someone knew what they're doing. And yeah. I can tell you there's a whole movement of us musicians that are now tuning to 432. And I'm one of those. But um, 
So the point is that if you take four octaves below 432, which, you know, just because you got your middle A note on a piano tuned properly, there's still a lower octave A note. And then there's a lower note on the piano and then a lower A note on the piano. And those are real simple, by the way. Uh, Pythagoras is the one I found out that if you want to find a lower octave of any frequency, all you do is divide by two. So 432, the lower octave is 216 and then 108 and then 54, and then 27. Well, the point of this is when you put a 27 hertz pulse through this scientific device called a cymoscope, what you get is a perfect seven-pointed star. Mm -hmm. So um, the inky you, crop circle... Do you get one for each one then, for 54 and 108, 216 as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. And what it, I had done is I had tracked down the proper cymatic image for every note in the musical scale and uh, tuned properly and the proper cymatic image for it. And I started creating these uh, glass crystal uh, subtle energy devices. Um, and I, so I've seen them on your, your website uh, Mike, at michaelleehill.net. And yes. they're beautiful. The color uh, of them are just absolutely gorgeous. So yeah, I invite our you. listeners to come check check this out, what we're talking about. Yeah, because that's actually a much evolved uh, product of where I was even at this point. Because uh, what I'd done is had one of those discs made for every note of the musical scale tuned properly. and But before I did these group of seven discs, I had just made one out of that inky crop circle. And, you know, it was sitting on the table. And then I got to these cymatic images. And mind you, the crop circle that showed up in uh, 2011, people can find this, by the way. Just type inky crop circle and it will come up. Um, I, uh, I had made an inky crop circle crystal disc just for poops and giggles, as they say. And um, I was making these discs and... When I got to the A note, here's the seven-pointed star looking me in the face, and I didn't realize it was the same thing that the inky crop circle was based off of. And I'm thinking, why does this look so familiar to me? Uh, you know, and it took me about ten minutes. It's like I couldn't; it wouldn't snap into like an aha moment for me. I just, I know, I know this. And after about ten minutes, and my brain, you know, my higher self, just going, "Don't worry about it. Just." relax and it'll come <laughs> and uh, nothing came right so I finally after about 10 minutes I'm like well okay and I just put the disc down I looked to my right and I seen the inky crop circle disc and I seen the seven pointed star and then I looked over at the four octaves below 432 and I went oh my god that was a moment of revelation because first of all I asked him to put the name inky into a crop circle and mm -hmm. what you'll find is that 2011 crop circle at the end of every point of the seven pointed star there's a row of circles some of them are filled in and some of them aren't it's like blank blank filled in blank blank almost like in school when you take a test you know mm -hmm. a multiple choice test and what you find out is it's actually ascii binary code and when you decode those lines it spells out ia space inky so they did put the name Inky into a crop circle <laughs> and they encoded it with something only I would be able to decode that it was based off of a seven pointed star, uh, which points us into the 432 subject matter. And really why this is important, people don't know this, but they left us this huge gift because mm -hmm. 2010 in Italy, in uh, the same field, I do believe, there was another crop circle. And in this crop circle, it encoded Einstein's famous equation, E uh -huh. equals MC squared. And, um, and it's encoded in ASCII binary code as well. And so what you find out is E equals MC squared. First of all, it's like our whole science of today is based on that equation. But quantum physicists now tell us that everything in existence exists as both a particle and a wave simultaneously. Well, that equation is only the particle part of the equation. It's right there, M equals mass. So E equals energy, and then C is the speed of light squared. So where is the frequency component in this uh, E equals MC squared? What you find, so 2010, crop circle, E equals MC squared, encoded. 2011, 
inky crop circle based on a seven-pointed star, which is four octaves below, creates a seven-pointed star. 432-based information. Well, what you get is 432 squared. So 432 times 432. Mm -hmm. Your listeners can check this out, too. It's not just my opinion, you know. <laughs> It is the speed of light within 1% accuracy. Oh, my God. So the only frequencies that plug into the E equals MC squared formula are 432-based frequencies. 431 won't do it. 433 won't do it. And 440 definitely isn't going to do it. It has to be 432. And um, so if you run the, the equation backwards, 432-based frequencies squared becomes C in the E equals uh, E... E equals MC squared. So 432 base frequencies become C squared times mass equals energy. It's truly uh, the guidepost to unlimited free energy. And what blew my mind is these mound sites. Uh, this information is encoded into the dimensions and layouts of the physical mound sites. Uh, uh. One wall will be 1,080 feet long. That's 108. It's two octaves below 432. Another wall will be 2,160. It's mind blowing. And like, so all along you go back to Samaria and you find out that right out of the gate, humanity, you know, had full functioning culture. They said, no one really understands how this happened, but you know, right out of Samaria, we had, we were given math and number systems and governance and law and you know, whatnot. Well, look at how many, seconds is in 12 hours it's 43,200 432 um mm. it's like they've given us the this knowledge and they're just waiting for us to wake up to start to understand the significance right to remember and then use it yes right? indeed so that's what the whole technology what i did then is i'm a you know as we we're talking about i'm a musician so in my studio i was pretty meticulous about making sure my guitar was tuned perfectly to 432 hertz and then i recorded a stereo sound file of me just hitting my a node it was nothing fancy um and then i sent that to the makers of the scientific equipment and hired them to image my guitar tuned properly well the response has actually been kind of historical they contacted me and said you know we've used this technology to image everything from dolphin sounds to baby noises to every frequency known to man, but we've never imaged an electric rock guitar amplifier. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, isn't that strange? You know, they said uh, they've never seen the kind of complexity or multidimensionality that was created from my audio clip I sent them. And uh. they said specifically, they think, you know, guitar amps are probably one of the only things that still uses vacuum tubes. You know, a good guitar amp has tubes in it and it gives you that, Jimi Hendrix kind of Van Halen crunch, you know? Mm -hmm. So they uh, hypothesized that it was the tubes and what they were doing to the signal that's creating this crazy uh, multidimensionality in the image. But they asked me for my permission to use that, the full 20 seconds, because what I got back was just one still frame out mm -hmm. of you know, for the full 20 seconds. They have a full 20 second video clip now up on uh, cymoscope.com. If you go to the video section, you'll find it um, of the image being created in real time. So you can see every time my pick hits the string, the whole image vibrates and takes on this form. Um, so it's evolved that that's now the image that I'm putting into my crystal discs and uh, Man, I've been just getting so much feedback of, I can tell you, Chief Golden Light Eagle, for one thing, he said, you know, people might know, they've seen singers that can break glass with their voice, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what they're doing is finding the resonant frequency of that glass. And what they'll do is beforehand, they'll tap it and they'll see where that, that glass, like what note it's dinging at, if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. or chiming at. And then if they hit that specific frequency with enough volume, it shatters the glass in the same way chief golden light eagle told me that the 432 hertz frequency shatters the walls of cancer cells huh. um so and, is it a, is it like an amplifier than an um, like a like a crystal like a crystalline where you use a crystal as an an amplifier like the tubes i'm uh, um what, what it is i yeah i understand what you're asking <laughs> yeah um, okay 
what it is is you know if you follow the idea that certain geometry has innate subtle energy um attributes you know like pyramid power you know mm -hmm. people know that if you take a pyramid made out of brass and put an apple in it the apple will stay fresh for much longer than if it's just left out of that pyramid um so when you take this idea that certain geometry has innate subtle energy properties well i had learned how to do these crystal discs that are called pleiadian healing discs and the idea was the most important thing was what sacred geometry image you're using to encode like into the crystal and um then you know quartz in itself every computer has quartz crystal in it because it you know takes that frequency and can work with it and store it and whatnot so uh um i'm trying to figure out how to explain this <laughs> <laughs> um so i i learned the art form from a, actually like a master student relationship i met one of his students that had learned from him and she taught me how to create these discs but simultaneously i had been studying cymatics and once you see like mother nature's geometry, how encoded these images are with sacred geometry. Like I've showed uh, on my website, you can take a cymatic image of a D note and then take the flower of life and superimpose it over top of it. And it just lines up perfectly. They're so encoded. So I thought, why use a computer generated sacred geometry image in these crystal disks? Why not go to mother nature and use the image of mother nature into these things. Mm. So what I can tell you is the discs themselves, I've found out, like for instance, I had a, a friend who is in the pure water business and in the process of making maple water, uh, uh, maple, I mean maple syrup, uh, they tap the bottom of the tree and water comes out. And in the past, farmers would just use that as like scrap water to wash their hands or whatever. Well, you find out it's one of the purest water on the planet because it gets filtered through the whole maple tree mm. and um so he calls us over he goes michael you got to see what your crystal disc these you know what this image is doing to the water and he poured there's four of us there and he took a plastic cup and put about an inch of water in each cup he said i want you to take a sip but don't pay attention to the taste pay attention more to the texture of the water because you'll see so i took a sip okay i got it he put it on the disc for about three seconds and he said that's all it takes now check it out i took a sip and like the actual structure of the water had changed it got so like more liquidy is that a word it was like <laughs> thick, thicker you know and I'll, sure huh. enough all of us tasted it and we're like wow so later on i had a, a vending table and this was interesting this little boy walks by he was only about six or seven years old and he's like ooh. And he walked up and he put his hand over one of my discs and uh his mom said um do you see energy he said yeah and his mom looks at me and she goes wouldn't it be nice to be able to see energy i can't but he's been able to see energy his whole life and mm -hmm. she picked up the disc and she said show me how high up it's coming and he went up about three foot above the disc and then all of a sudden he put his hand under the disc as well and she goes oh it's coming out the bottom too and he said yeah you know mm -hmm. and um so a lot of confirmation that you know this thing is putting off an energy field what i was told is that 432 image itself is it's such a high frequency that's creating it that it just blocks all lower like arconic mind control mm -hmm. kind of frequencies and uh so that's why you know it became very important to me to find out some way of making this technology wearable because the crystals you can't really wear them first of all it's kind of too heavy and um each disc is wrapped in copper um which keeps the energy inside and manip like balanced and amplified and whatnot but it doesn't make something you can wear and by the way this guy that had the maple water i asked him what do you think is creating the effect is it the crystal he said no he believed it was the image itself uh, the 432 oh. image so what i did make a long story short is i made necklaces now that um incorporate the image right into the necklace and I have two different versions of the image one it goes through the natural human chakra colors from red in the root to purple in the crown and uh, 
in all the mm -hmm. colors in between. That's what makes up the colors of that image. But in Native American Indian culture, they believe that once one is went through ascension, all your chakras reverse. And so the other side is I have the inverted chakra color scheme. As that was well. going to be one of my questions is that was inverted and I wondered why. So you answered yeah. the question. Yes, and... <laughs> well, it's interesting because the necklace has both. It's the only thing I make that actually has both. Uh, actually, that's not true because now I started, I took both and I superimposed them over top of one another and I created. Um, it's interesting because uh, you asked about the rainbow uh, warrior mm -hmm. uh, prophecy and what had happened was after all of this, and I went through, have you ever heard of the Emerald Tablets of Toth? Uh-huh. Um, well, that's what I went through. The, the Halls of Amenti, I didn't even know this, but it's real. And I was brought before, and I'm not talking channeling or anything. This is in the real world. And, uh, Three days. I didn't, uh, didn't know I was being tested, but and when the veil dropped, the person that was overseeing this ceremony said, Michael, I work with the seven lords of light and the seven lords of darkness. And, uh, you know, I said, congratulations, you're the first one in this time cycle that got through the gate. And just like Toth, you know, once you get through the mm -hmm. gate, the veil of darkness has to fall away. Because if one of us can do it, all of us can do it because mm -hmm. we're truly one. But um, so make a long story short, after all that testing, and getting through the gate and the veil dropping and this individual revealing to me who he was, which was the person in between those two councils. He said, I'm the only one that holds a seat on both light and dark councils. And I sit directly in between the two councils. And um, so after all this, one of the grandmothers came up to me and she said, Michael, I want to, uh, uh, we're gifting you this journal. And what it was, was it had a huge eagle on it and uh in the native american indian culture eagle status is kind of like christ consciousness mm -hmm. it's uh it's a higher state of consciousness where they feel like the eagle is the only bird that flies above the storm you know when trouble comes it doesn't seek shelter below the storm it rises above it and gets like kind of like the bird's eye you know of the Thank bigger pitch yeah, so uh, she said, I want you to pay attention. This has a giant eagle on it. And she said, you are the rainbow we've been waiting for. And mm -hmm. she said, because people don't understand what the whole rainbow warrior thing is. She said, every chakra has a double tetrahedron in that chakra. And when it's spinning correctly and balanced, it emits light. And mm -hmm. that it, it emits the colors of the rainbow from your root chakra emanates red all the way up through purple in the crown and to those that have the third eye sight to see energy that that human will become the whirling rainbow out of the rainbow warrior prophecy so then about a month later i was at a star knowledge conference and i was given my actual native american indian spirit name and um it is rainbow warrior eagle Huh. That, that's, that's a cool name. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's good that have pulled out of the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I can uh, I can say we are right in the midst of the Rainbow Warrior prophecy coming to fruition, and uh, because of what's happening in the Standing Rock, you know, the United States mm -hmm. government knows you can't be going around the world talking about civil rights when. The United States was based on the largest genocide ever committed on this planet. And some people put the genocide as high as 100 million Native American Indian women, children, and men were slaughtered. Mm -hmm. And um, and all the treaties have been broken. So, man, I'm going to spill the beans here. But I'm working with some people that, like, I was just sent a book of all the treaties that have been broken. And uh, there's a big movement now even within the United States government that, uh, man, this is huge, but imagine going back to the survey from 1775 and everything that was Native American lands will be given back to the Native American Indians. They'll be recognized for who they mm -hmm. truly are, which is this lost nation. Um, and it's really fascinating because, like I said, I found out that my hometown of East Lake, Ohio, is the first site of the mound builders ever on this planet. Once they left, you know, the Mayans, they just 
continually traveled right up through the middle of the United States until they dead ended at Lake Erie and set up camp. And uh, this, this, my hometown here had a mound site that had walls that were 660 feet long and had a huge pyramid in the middle of this walled structure around it. And uh, so what's interesting is then you find out, I have newspaper articles now I'm going to be releasing. I've been working with the East Lake Historical Society and getting this uh, information that, first of all, the mound builders were here and they built this mound site here. But then after that, the Erie Montauk Indian tribe ended up being here. And then after that, the Iroquois Seneca came and did battle and kicked out the, the Erie Montauk out of this area and they took it over. And the Iroquois, as you know, Edward Casey and what I found out, mm -hmm. that's the uh, remnants of the Atlanteans. Mm -hmm. So as weird as all this sounds, I started to realize there's this road. It's one of the oldest roads in this area, and it's called Lost Nation. <laughs> well, I was like, oh, I wonder who named it that, you know? And oh, uh, you, that's not a coincidence, right? <laughs> no, it gets even crazier because I'm really wondering. It had to be a Templar because the Templars were very yeah. instrumental in, you know, the formation of the United States. You find out our forefathers went to the Seneca to find out how they. Uh, united their five tribes that had been at war with one another for a very long time and somehow they were able to unite their tribes and here the United States wanted to unite these states you know and this is not how things were done and our whole government was based on their form of government um, so what I want your listeners to do is just go to Google Maps Google Earth type in Lost Nation Ohio then they'll take you right to the road. Take Lost Nation until it dead ends onto Lakeshore Boulevard, right at Lake Erie. And if you take a left within one mile, one and a half miles, you're at the first site of the mound builders ever in mm -hmm. the United States. And what sits there now is East Lake Middle School, which is really fascinating to me because they know the Indians never lived at these sites. They know their vortexes of energy. They wouldn't mm -hmm. even enter these areas unless they had done a lot of ceremony to clean their psychic vessel so they didn't bring sure. anything of darkness because if you're in a vortex it's going to amplify anything it doesn't it's unbiased so they made sure they're clean vessels you know so to speak mm -hmm. now we got a school with poor kids you know <laughs> just sitting there and oblivious but anyhow <laughs> instead of taking a left off of lost nation hang a right and you'll see right in the street names if someone was trying to erase this from our history books, it's like someone was making sure it would be recorded here for the future. The street names that you'll come to is the first is Iroquois, and then uh, Seneca, Cherokee, Mohawk, and then Tioga. I'm like, well, what the hell's Tioga mean? So I type in Tioga, and I find out it's the Erie, it's the Iroquois word for the place of entry. Isn't that fascinating? So. Yeah. Um, it's built right into our street names here, and you don't have to take my uh, word for it. Um, so what's happening right now, it's very strange because it's not even debatable that East Lake, Ohio is the home base, home site of the Iroquois Seneca. Well, people don't know the Seneca is the only tribe that is were never defeated. They still own their land in uh, New York. As a matter of fact, when you go through there, there's a big sign that says you've now left the United States. You've left New York. You're under the law of the Seneca Nation, and there's a, a toll to even travel through this land, but your toll is being paid by the United States government. And um, Salamanca, which is where Niagara Falls is, is the only city in the United States that's not owned by the United States. It's leased to the United States by the Seneca Nation. Uh, and in 19, it was the late 1990s, this 99 year lease was up uh, to lease this land to the United States. So they had to redo this contract, this treaty. And in, in that time, uh, the Seneca was given $80 million and it was uh, in the treaty now, the United States pays them a million dollars a year to lease that land from the Seneca Nation. So there's already a legal precedent that the Seneca own their own land and that where they have it, if there's, 
the United States wants to use it, they have to lease it back from the Seneca. And it ain't my opinion, you know, it's it's right there. Um, so what I want to tell you is what the powers that be didn't know is they hid their home base. They hid East Lake, Ohio is their land. East Lake, Ohio has never been owned by the United States. They don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh um so right now i'm in contact with uh you know this this whole book of civil rights violations against the native american indians and truly i can tell you the united states government is working on going back to the 1775 survey and um the uh, finally the native american indians will be viewed as their own nation and mm -hmm. they'll have their own currency, their own laws that will not be part of the United States. And um, I can tell you that uh, this also involves the unveiling of unlimited free energy through cold fusion that the Standing Rock Sioux have already went to the Treasury and asked for this technology to be funded to uh, because it's non-polluting, you know, in Standing Rock, they're standing up for, you know, you're polluting our water, you're damaging right. the environment, whereas this technology is non-polluting and they've already went to the Treasury and said, we want funding to bring this unlimited free energy um, to the Standing Rock reservation and this technology by the way has been already confirmed in uh, popular mechanics and there's been a 2020 show where these scientists other scientists other than the guy that uncovered this unlimited this cold fusion that it's it's true and the his results have been duplicated so what I'm telling you is these lands it will be the Native American Indians who bring this world into a new and the rainbow warrior prophecy you know the the rainbow warriors would be the ones that brought back make make this world green again and peace and harmony so the way i view it is no one will be excluded you know uh it'll just show the hypocrisy of the system that because the united states was always intended to be a beacon of light you know, and there's been many presidents that warned us, you know, beware of the money masters, you know, and, and uh, you know, all the way up to Kennedy, even. He was going up against the Federal Reserve. You find out that's, that's where the problem really kicked into high gear was the creation of the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. um, but so we're right on the verge of some mind-blowing, massive... Uh, changes on this planet and the revealing of the Native American Indians as the true Anunnaki human hybrid bloodline on this planet. So put that uh, right along with them returning. The Anunnaki are here and they're going to, they've already told me, you know, when the timing's right, um, there'll be official first contact. And, you know, uh, I was brought in through the NSA into a meeting about a lot of them were very worried about fundamentalist religion and how they would respond to the subject matter. Would there, would there be panic, you know, and all this? Mm -hmm. And it was strange because at that point it hit me. I go, well, why don't you reveal the reality of the Anunnaki in Earth's past first? And it's really interesting, like Carmen Bolter, who did the uh, – the Pyramid Code series for the History Channel. Um, she has new a new documentary coming out. I'm friends with her now, and I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of her work. Um, that uh, using ground penetrating radar under the labyrinth in Egypt. It's called the labyrinth. You can check it out. Um, they found a huge sprawling complex that's 60 feet under the sand, and she said some of the rooms are the size of grocery stores. And some of the smaller rooms are the size of Olympic swimming pools. And the hallways that connect these rooms, that if you just took the hallways out and put them end to end, you would have over a mile and a half of hallway just to walk through to get from room to room. But they know these rooms are filled with artifacts and gold. But that's only at level 60 foot. At 110 foot, there's another whole sprawling complex that mirrors the 60 foot level. And those rooms are also filled with gold and artifacts. But she said there's no connection between 60 foot and 110 foot. There's no hallway that will take you from one to the other. And they believe these complexes were never above ground. They, they were built underground. So wrap your head around that, you know. Huh. But um, 
you know, in Egypt, the only thing above the sand of the Sphinx in the early 1900s was its head. They had to uncover, you know, excavate all that sand around it until they went, oh, wow, there's a body, you know? Well, mm -hmm. similarly, um, about 99% of the pyramids that are in Egypt are still under the sand. And mm -hmm. these pyramids are pristine. They haven't had the outer granite, you know, marble casing ripped off of it like we did to the ones in yeah. Egypt. We've With never top, right? <laughs> indeed. So humanity has never seen a pristine pyramid in its original state. And, you know, all it takes is an Anunnaki sand sucker. <laughs> Bring in the sand suckers. But anyhow. And do you think there would be something like that underneath uh, 60 feet, 100 feet in East Lake, Ohio as well? Yes. Uh, well, yeah. first of all, you find out in this area, it's the largest salt deposits uh, hmm. on the planet. And there's huge salt mines under Lake Erie. And a matter of fact, Morton Salt is about five minutes away from this area. And they, you know, oh. so what I've discovered, too, and by the way, back in the day, Morton Salt used to give tours. And you could, you know, go down a mile under the lake and check out the salt mines. But I heard a lot of people say when you got down there, there are certain shafts that there would be an armed guard there. You know, like you don't go down that shaft, you know. Huh. Um, but I'll tell you, when... Um, A.R. Borden told me, he said, Michael, you know what's underneath you in that area. And by the way, he told me in the past, too, he said, ah, that serpent in, you know, the Valley of Ohio there. He said these mound sites will be proof that the Anunnaki were in that area a very long time ago. And um, so he told me that, you know, the, the world's oldest underground base that's not ours is under Lake Erie. And he said, <laughs> one, of, he said one of the entry points to this uh, complex was um, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, mm -hmm. Ohio. And he said they could go down there and take like the high speed, you know, shuttle service, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, from Detroit, they could be in 10 minutes to the underground base. And I'm like, well, I'm all ears, you know, what's it look like? <laughs> and he said under there, there was huge, um, huge open spaces that kind of look like you went into a huge Sumerian, you know, pre-Egypt yeah. uh, uh, uh. landscape. And that's where they spent most of their time. They said that it was a big open hall where they would come and work. And um, But then there was hallways, offshoots, um, off, and that there's private living quarters then off of these offshoots. And, Thank you. Uh, I'm like, wow, yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait to hear. We have to have you back on again on the show again and tell us your next findings and and um we want to let the listeners know that you will be the uh, star speaker at the star knowledge uh conference as uh, upcoming star knowledge conference the 11 11 star teachings and solar eclipse ceremony it's a ceremony february 26th uh, this weekend in Golden, Colorado, and you can go to uh, StarKnowledgeEnterprises.com and find out all the information. If you can't make it, they are streaming it. So if you can't physically go, you can still be there in spirit and yeah. uh, go ahead and, and do the streaming of it, which means everyone can attend. So we really uh, want to thank you for coming on and, and go pleasure. to your, your, your website, michaelleehill.net. Thank you, Michael. Peace. Thank you. <laughs> Peace out, everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks, Patrick. You're welcome. Have Thanks, a good Patrick. weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And thanks for calling in. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. 